the trouble is nowadays with our insta-perfect pretty world is people are naturally more suspicious. So when you want something, would they want to know why? Why do you want it? Sadly, nine times out of ten, they won't even get to the why. They'll just say no. So we need to be, we need to talk less and impact more. We need to get to the point quickly, and we need to validate that it's a valuable proposition for them. You are now listening to the Going North Podcast with your host, author and speaker, Dom Bregman. And every Monday and Thursday, you're going to hear the voice of a different author share their stories, expertise, and their struggles that they had to overcome in life to leave you inspired to get more out of your life. Be sure to not only listen to this episode, but share with others, connect with the authors, and always advance others to advance yourself. Now let's get on with the show. Well, today on the Going North podcast... We're interviewing wonderful folks from all over the world who have written amazing books, and this gentleman right here is no different. This guy right here, he is the modern-day Wizard of Oz. That's right, folks. Forget about the movie. This guy is the modern-day Wizard of Oz himself. He has made a living by making the impossible happen. He is the founder of Bluefish, which is the world's most elite luxury Concierge service delivering many celebrities, professional athletes, and, and individuals' dreams that allow them to live their life to the fullest from the highest level of personalized travel, transportation, and cutting-edge entertainment services. And you're probably wondering who this wonderful gentleman right here is. It's the one, the only, Double S himself, Mr. Steve Sims. How are you today, sir? Well, that's a hell of a lead-in, so thank you very much. I hope I can live up to it. <laughs> uh, don't worry. You're, you're doing it right now. You're doing it right now, man. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Modern, so modern-day Wizard of Oz, man. So mind telling us a bit of how you got to that title? I was just a guy that actually was able to get stuff done and it was um you know it started off getting people into clubs it started off getting people into uh exclusive parties then it started getting them into hollywood award shows milan fashion weeks uh monaco grand prix and it just got bigger and bigger so it went from getting people into events to sending them down to the titanic putting them on stage with their favorite rock star having guns and roses teach them to play drums having ZZ Top teach them how to play guitar. It just got more ridiculous, and the requests got larger and larger and larger. And the more I did, the, the, the kind of more excitement around it became. Um, and it's, it's just a great path. And So it's 20-plus 20, 20 years, I think 23 years now, where I've just been giving really rich people exciting cocktail stories. <laughs> oh man, exciting indeed, exciting indeed, and they're so exciting that someone actually helped you to get confident about writing the book about all of it. Yeah, that was uh, that was the thing that you see before. If anyone, if anyone's ever unfortunate enough to see what I look like, I'm a big, I'm a big lump of ugly. And uh, before October 2017. It was kind of a big deal to a very small amount of people. Um, then someone actually approached me and said, hey, you know, you're a bricklayer from London that's now doing these kind of things. Any chance you would actually be able to uh, write a book, not on what you do, but how you do it? And this suddenly gave me a big thing to do. It was, uh, it, it, it was quite something. So the book's out there now. Uh, actually, it got launched in uh, Chinese um, I think it was like about two months ago, and I got told yesterday it's a bestseller now. So it's now going international. (laughs) 
As it should, as it should. I think I was remember. <laughs> uh, man, because I think it was in. Not sure. It was one of the earlier chaps that told the story how you actually was in China and you <laughs> ended up working up that nightclub. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't a glorious. It, it, like everything, the early stages are never glorious. You can look at Jeff Bezos, you know, the head of Amazon, one of the richest men in the world, and still see pictures of him packing boxes in his garage. So the early days, the early days are always uncomfortable for everybody. I was just very, very fortunate that um, I had an upside. Oh, yeah, that's right. Because you went there to become a banker, but then you actually <laughs> flipped it and became like a bouncer and then actually turning a club upside down to being the hottest club in the whole darn city. <laughs> yeah, it was it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. I think the big the big difference was I just wasn't willing to accept things. I wanted to try things that were different. I wanted to grow and and that's what I was very fortunate in in order to be able to do. I was able to grow and try different things. That's right. It's true. It's true indeed. Grow things like trees, baby. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man oh man oh man <laughs> and the thing about the passwords and, and funny enough bluefish i get i guess naming the company bluefish and that being one of the codes i'm guessing that was probably the most popular password that folks asked <laughs> to yeah get it, it yeah what i did was i used to throw these secret you know secret kind of underground parties even though some of them are being penthouses um and I would tell people where it was, um, but I would give them a password. And they had to go up to a doorman, and they had to give this password. And they do, if they didn't give the password, they didn't get in. So we made them a little bit stupid. They were things like, name the line out of the line, the witch in the wardrobe. Another one was uh, named two of the Teletubbies. And one <laughs> of them was Finnish. Yeah, they were, they were ridiculous. Um, and the third one that we commonly used was finish this uh, sentence, one fish, two fish, red fish. So the classic answer is blue fish. So we never expected it to be the name of a company. We never expected any of that to happen. Um, and then all of a sudden it just grew and people were literally contacting us going, hey, are you that blue fish company? Um, and originally we were, like, we were saying to people, no, who's that? Because it had been used as a password. We didn't realize that people were now starting to think it was the name of the company. <laughs> oh, man. It's kind of funny how that happens out of nowhere sometimes. It's hilarious how that happens. And, uh, yeah, it, 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 it was very funny. <laughs> yeah, because when I read that part of the book, and it, it just kind of led me to Robert Greene's book, The Law of Seduction, is because people always want the mystical and the mysterious. So that's just really amazing. Absolutely. We don't want what we can buy. We want what we can't obtain. Um, it's, uh, it's the uh, air of exclusivity and desire. That's right. It was so simple, too. It's, it's like one of the complicated, just random stuff from, like, kid shows and whatnot. <laughs> yeah, I've often found that the simplest, most direct stuff is the most impactful. So I've, I've maintained my life to try not to complicate it for you or for me. Oh, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right indeed. That's right indeed. And probably one of my favorite things that I've underlined from the book was don't be easy to understand, but be impossible to misunderstand. <laughs> yes, I, I'm, I'm stunned how many people actually try to um, complicate things to try and sound more intelligent. It's not fooling anyone. It is confusing everyone. And most people will walk away from it. So if you don't understand what I'm saying, that's my problem. So I want to make sure that I'm impossible to misunderstand. Yep, that is so true indeed, especially nowadays where it's so easy to get information about certain things to certain people and just make life easier for you. It's like <laughs> it's kind of close to difficult to not make it complicated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. From turning nightclubs around to brick by brick, I guess pun intended since you were a bricklayer, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was a masonry boy, yep, I was loading up. 
to actually just transforming that into actually creating experiences for people. So what really helped you to actually at least build relationships that way so you can actually get some of those experiences done for people? I think the I think the key was the ease. I think the key was the fact that because I didn't complicate things, I made it very easy for people to understand what it was that I actually wanted. So I was able to go to people and say, hey, can you do this? I want it because of this, and I will do this for it. I took out the air of complication. I took out the air of suspicion. A lot of people will go up and they will ask for something. Well, sadly, a lot of people don't ask, but a lot of people (laughs) will ask for something and expect it to be a favor. And any time you phone somebody up, especially if you don't know them, they can guarantee you're after something. Why? Because you phoned them. So I actually, I'll contact someone. I'll say, hey, Jim, uh, thanks a lot for taking the call. I want you to do this. So I will tell them straight away what I want. And then I will say, and I'm going to tell you why I believe it's a damn good idea that we actually do this together. Because I'm aware, and this is where you research, I'm aware that you are doing a gala for some repairs to the school, or I'm aware that you're releasing a new book, or I'm aware that you're going in concert, and I can help you promote and market that. So you actually show them straight away that there's a reason outside of just paying a check or a reason outside of just doing what what it is you need that you've actually thought about what's going on and you're now showing you, you care about that project that charity, that gala, that concert, whatever. You're showing that you care about making something good for them. Uh, that's actually good. It's same from their point of view, and it's it's really true. It's like you, you call some people, it's like, all right, so what do you want? <laughs> you just give it Yeah, no, them. exactly. Everyone already knows you want something. The second you phone someone... It's because you want something, even if it's to ask what you're having for dinner or what time are you meeting them at the pub. You know, every time you contact someone, it's bloody obvious you want something. Otherwise, you wouldn't have called them. Exactly. <laughs> it's so true. It's like just get it out the way and then just try to make it win-win for them, which is awesome and just classic negotiation 101. Yeah, that's the, that's the key. The key is to make sure that it shows that it's a value. That's right. Just being valuable and giving the value. <laughs> show it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I guess show and tell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, that is awesome indeed. So basically just get to the point and make sure you let folks know how they can actually win from this as opposed to you just winning all by yourself and just running away, smile while they're just feeling like a piece of crap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, you, and it makes things easier. Um, the trouble is nowadays with our insta-perfect pretty world is people are naturally more suspicious. So when you want something, would they want to know why. Why do you want it? Sadly, nine times out of ten, they won't even get to the why. They'll just say no. So we need to be, we need to talk less and impact more. We need to get to the point quickly, and we need to validate that it's a valuable proposition for them. The bottom line is if I do something with you that benefits me but doesn't benefit you, then we're not going to do it. But if I can show a way that it's irresistible to you, it excites you, it's passionate for you to be involved in what I want, then I've got you 110%. Uh, beautiful indeed, beautiful indeed. It kind of <laughs> almost kind of reminds me of like how some folks ignore their emails because <laughs> they get so many. <laughs> you know, I was actually listening to one of your interviews before this one, and it mentioned how email lists are kind of like the new phallic symbol. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. The pe- people would just. 
people will bandy around. It's also likes, isn't it? You know, everyone bandies around. Oh, I got 50,000 likes on this post, and I've got 10,000 people on my email list. You can't pay your bar tab with either of those numbers. You can only pay your bar tab when those convert into people that actually work with you, do business with you. So all the time is a big number. Isn't impressing anyone? Yep, it's true. It's really just helping the person just to uh, gas up their ego. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's a lot of ego play now. And, um, you know, I saw someone the other day that was uh, doing a lot of work on Instagram. And they were really pushing and pushing and pushing to try and get as many followers as possible. The trouble is most of their followers were like 12-year-old and in the Philippines. And <laughs> they, they were telling me how many followers they had now. And I said to them, I said, well, that's great. But how are you paying the mortgage? How are you paying the, 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 the bills? How are you keeping the phone on? Um, and they hadn't focused on that. They were, they were doing a Field of Dreams moment. They thought if they had a lot of followers, the richness would follow. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, it's true. And, I mean, especially if all the likes are from folks in the Philippines and you're, like, in California or something. <laughs> we'll, we'll get yeah, that it's not helping. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, hey, I like your message, especially if the if it doesn't translate as well. You just get, <laughs> get the whole language, get a separate language, especially if it was like Farsi or something. <laughs> you see all these squiggly <laughs> lines everywhere. <laughs> this happened to me once. I'm like, what the heck is this? Like, translate. It doesn't translate. No. <laughs> no. That's weird. But there's people out there like that. Yeah, it's true indeed. But the good thing about it is we got folks like you out there who aren't all about they just actually making it happen for people and just making their dreams come true in more ways than one. And it's kind of awesome because it's like you just over deliver. Yeah, you've got to. You've always got, you've always got to over deliver. Whatever, pay, whatever people pay for, make sure you give them like 10, 15, 20% more than what they paid for. That's what will get them coming back to you. That's right, that's right. And I think one of the most important cases of that is probably when you got into the part where you mentioned I should ask a person why at least three times if they don't seem passionate about what they originally call you for. Yeah. People are weird now. They don't say what they want. I've often said that I've never given anybody anything that they asked for. I've given what they wanted. And so when people talk to you about that level of request, you really got to kind of listen to them and kind of try to understand why do you want to do this? What's the hidden reason behind it? There you go. They could be asking for a snake when all they really want is just a fishing rod, right? Every single day. <laughs> uh, sounds like a probably a blog post or something. It's like, yep, give him the fishing rod, not the snake. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you blue fish right there. <laughs> oh man. Oh man. Well, for those who are just like lacking passion in their business right now and they haven't picked up your book yet to help them get their passion. What piece of advice would you give to them? Because it can be a little difficult out there when you're making folks' dreams come true, but there may be a time where, who knows, it may be a little challenging to keep motivated or keep passionate about it. So any advice for those? Yeah, well, the first piece of advice would be to grab the book. And before anyone thinks, oh, he's just trying to sell a book, let me, let me explain. I make 80 cents per book. So I'm certainly not doing it for the money, 80 cents, okay? But I think people, one of my little tips and tricks that helped me was to do something different. If you, if you for argument's sake, you meet your buddy and your buddy comes over to you and he's got a new jacket or he's got a new car or he's got a new watch, he's got something new, okay? The following day when you go out, you suddenly start seeing that car everywhere or you suddenly start seeing that jacket everywhere or the watch everywhere. The reason you do that is because your mind is now open to seeing it. It was probably already there, 
But have you ever had those moments where you see a yellow car and then the following day all you ever see is yellow cars? Oh, well, yeah. What, yeah. So what we need to do is we need to train our mind to open up and look for anything. Notice everything. So if you go to work one way, go a different route one day. If you go to a sandwich bar every day, try a different sandwich bar. If you go to a pub on the end of a, a hard week, try a different bar, try a different pub, try a different appetizer when you're in a restaurant that you've never, ever had before. It may be crap, but you won't know until you try it. And the more you open up your mind to doing things that are not as the same as you did every day, your mind opens up and questions itself and says, okay, what else are we going to be doing that we don't always do? And nine times out of ten, it'll start searching for opportunities. And it's those opportunities that allow you to kind of start doing something. So in the early stages, just go to work a different way. Try a different piece of food. Try things different. Get used to training your mind that you're not the same as you usually are. Uh, beautiful indeed. I guess in a way that helps you to get to that 1% better every day thing, right? Absolutely, and it's tiny little steps, and traveling to work a different route, that doesn't cost you anything. That's true, it doesn't. <laughs> you get to see something new as well. Bingo, absolutely. Well, one of the key things that I loved about, about the book is just the tips about keeping relationships going, and that's to actually sending physical snail mail to books and forms of actual cards and like wrapping paper and whatnot. So any recommendations for folks for actually doing that, just going beyond the simple thank you card or possibly keeping just the communication alive between two parties? Yeah, just, just look, no one cares until you show you care. So you've got to be able to take, you've got to be able to focus on your interaction with people. So, there are the snail mail ways of just sending them a note, but the first thing you've got to do is stop typing it. Every interaction in the form of mail going to someone should be handwritten. And I don't mean pick a font on, a, uh, on your, your program that looks like handwriting. Get a pen and actually write so that they can see the paper has pressure on it and show it. And then when you post things to someone... Try and post something in there a little bit funny, okay? A little bit caring, a little bit close. So if you know someone likes, I don't know, let's make it up, they like uh, trucks, okay? And in your magazine was a picture of a new truck or a new set of wheels for a truck or something. Tear the picture out, fold it up, stick it in there and say, hey, I saw this, thought you may be interested. And just show that you paid attention to the fact that they're looking for truck wheels or they're looking to fly to Italy and you saw a, um, a piece of um, an article in the magazine about Italy. Or even, here's another thing, send them the whole magazine about Italy and say, hey, I know you're thinking about Italy. I saw this magazine. Thought you'd like it. Magazines cost about five bucks. But how much is the relationship worth? If you're making money, if you're, make, if you're breeding loyalty, if you're not worrying about the retention of that client, then, then great. But invest in the clients to be able to breed that. Love that. Invest in the clients. <laughs> that, that's gold right there. And especially with that comparison. It's like a magazine. It's like, what, five bucks opposed to like the relationship, which is priceless. So when you put it in that perspective, it's one heck of a no-brainer to actually probably just go – the extra mile and actually do something out of the box that way it actually I guess in a way be unforgettable yeah yeah that's it be unforgettable that's 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 a very good way to put it you just put it better than I could have well done <laughs> oh sweet sweet <laughs> sweet 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 as 20 pecan pies well, with all the wonderful experiences, you got a chance to actually speak at both not only Harvard, but also the Pentagon. So how does it feel to be now a keynote speaker, traveling the world, and telling folks about all the wonderful stuff you get to do for people? At first, it was very exciting. 
you know, being flown over the planet to actually speak to like thousands of people was kind of like, wow, this is brilliant. Um, uh, now it's actually quite scary because there's a huge commitment. If you're going into a room of a thousand people, you need to change minds. You need to get people to do things differently. You need to help them grow. You need to help them people realize that they can do absolutely anything. So now you have a responsibility. So I think the first couple of speeches, I was all very excited. Now I actually spend a lot of time going, okay, what's the problem that needs to be solved? You know, when I walk on stage, I know you're smart, but I need to make you smarter by the time I get off. So what needs to be answered? So there's a lot of, there's a lot of commitment. Now it still excites me because with all things that are scary, when you get over the other side of something being scary, you're all the adrenaline and the excitement and everything's there. And I love nothing more than getting connected and getting contacted by people going, hey, I read your book or I saw you on stage or I, or I bought your course and I then went and did this. And it really excites me that people are not just buying it and just propping open the door with it or just ignoring the ideas. You see, the bottom line of it is... There is no one that was out there that was less able to do what I'm doing than me. I was a bricklayer from East London, no money, no college education, and I'm speaking at Harvard. So I'm telling everybody (laughs) that you can absolutely do it every single time. You just need to want it more than anyone. You need to focus on it, and you need to keep it simple. The best ideas are the simple ideas. That's right, especially when you actually execute them. Oh, that's, and that's the key. A, a brilliant idea with no action is useless. A half assed idea with implementation is brilliant. Oh, yeah. Mrs. Extra Shiny. That's what I'm talking about. Extra Shiny. <laughs> Woo! Well, since you're always about learning and growing, is there... Any books in particular that you've been reading lately that have been really just helping you grow recently? Any good books? Um, I'm always reading books. I have to admit, over the Christmas period uh, that we're just getting out of now, I haven't been reading much. I've been focusing on a family, focusing. We released a course called The Distillery, so we've been focusing on the development and the launch of that. So at this moment in time, I have to say, I have a pile of books. And funny enough, they're right next to me. Um, you know, Tim Ferriss has sent me one. And so I've got a bunch of books here as well. I actually got uh, Robert Sharman, J. Abraham sent me another book. Someone sent me a really nice book that I'm looking at in, uh, reading about. Rebuilding the Brand by Clyde Fessler. It's the uh, story about um, Harley Davidson rebuilding the brand and the awareness of it. So... Looking forward to all of those. Oh, yeah. Especially since you're a motorcycle guy, you're probably really looking to dig into that book. Well, I like the idea of of people building brands. And I like the idea that everyone's business should be a brand. But I also find it very interesting when someone steps into an existing brand how they can grow it and change it while still retaining what the core stands for. So, yes, that's in motorcycles, so I obviously have that addiction. Um, But I'm very interested in how he handles the responsibility of somebody else's brand. Because as entrepreneurs, we are our own brand. So imagine you walking into somebody else's world that's already in existence and continuing what they stand for. It's got to be quite a... It's going to be quite scary. Well, when you put it that way, yeah. <laughs> Especially if you're not passionate about it from the beginning. Well, probably shouldn't probably shouldn't take that on in the first place. But it's like, yeah, that's actually true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's scary. Just, well, with all of your wonderful experiences and good stuff, a question like to ask all the guests is, if you were to wake up tomorrow and you were 25 again in the current year, but you get to keep all of your experience what advice would you give to yourself? 
I would just tell myself to stay off of the cheap whiskey, only top shelf. Um, <laughs> the bottom line of it is, is every time you screw up, fall over, fail, do something wrong, get your head smacked in, any time any of these things happen, you grow and learn from it. I wouldn't want to disrespect my younger self by missing out on all those growth opportunities. So I actually would not guide myself in any way, shape, or form other than just to say, keep going, kid, you'll be fine. <laughs> That's right. Keep going and avoid the cheap whiskey. <laughs> yep, always. <laughs> Woo! Well, all righty, that is beautiful indeed, beautiful indeed. So for those who want to keep in contact with you and keep up with what you're doing, especially that program coming up soon, what's the best way to reach you? So they can do a couple of things. They can text the word SIMS, S-I-M-S, to 345345. That's SIMS, S-I-M-S. 345345, or go to Steve D. Sims. Again, that's Sims as in 1M. Steve D. Sims.com, that's my website. But if they text me, they'll also get a PDF, which has got the cheat sheet from the book. And one of my favorite videos called The Chug Test. Oh, yeah. Chug Test is definitely a good one. <laughs> Chuck, this was definitely a good one. <laughs> it goes back to the simplicity thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, there you have it, folks. The wonderful Steve Sims baby going ahead and text over to that wonderful 345345 and get that random, random notification that's going to be good for your brain and good for your life. It'll change your life. I went ahead and texted it the other day, and it's really awesome because it's more interaction. It's not the random email that'll live in there forever. It'll actually be good for you. So any parting words for the folks still listening? Do something different. Just literally whatever it is, just do it slightly different. doesn't matter what it is. Listen to a different radio station. Walk a different way to work, but for one day, just do something a little bit different. Thanks a bunch for your listening ears on the Going North Podcast. I hope you really, really enjoyed that episode. If you enjoyed the episode, be sure to share it with your friends and family, especially those who love podcasts and love listening to some inspiration and motivation. 